Welcome listeners. This is Literally Goa, the program that looks at books and authors from Goa. Today we have with us Fatima Norona and uh, she is the author of one book and many short stories and many other things as you will hear as we go along. Fatima, a bit about yourself. I'm a, a grandmother, that's a, the, the new thing, so I'm always full of that. I'm a grandmother and of course uh, I've been writing for many years. Uh, my first published short story was uh, when I was in college in 1973. And a modified version of it is in uh, Stray Mango Branches, since it's a kind of uh, uh, traditional short story from Goa. So I think you are more familiar with the stray mango branches than I yeah, am. Yeah. You know, if I could say I was surprised that uh, I had actually uh, not known you for so many years and we got yeah. to know each other maybe four or five years back. Yeah. Uh, you're, you come from a literary family, if I may say so. I, mm. I knew of your dad, your mom, we'll talk about that later. Mm. Uh, many of your sisters and, you know, in different capacities, but I never knew yeah. you all were all one family. Mm. Uh, of course, Stray Mango Branches is your book in that sense. Yeah. And it is a very unusual mix of fiction and non-fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, before I introduce Stray Mango Branches, I would like to say one thing about you. You are only the second Goan whom I came to know who had actually got a story published or what should I say aired on the BBC World Service when it was at its peak <laughs> in the 70s probably. Tell us it how is. it is. It is. It is. Yes. And the other Goan who I knew who got his work uh, read out there, uh, you know, kind of broadcast Nazareth. there, yeah, was Peter Nazareth mm -hmm. and uh, probably also Venita Coelho, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. that I learned that recently. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your short story, how it got on the air. And I mean, BBC was a big station in those days and it was quite a challenge. Uh, we used to listen to that short story every Sunday. There was a short story every Sunday. And uh, when I uh, began to write short stories and all. I said, uh, maybe it sounds better than it looks. And I sent, the, sent it there. That was it. And uh, what age? What age? Yeah, were you no, then? I had a little, I had a little baby then. <laughs> so, so I was in my late twenties. So who would you credit with, uh, you know, inculcating this art of reading, writing, short stories? I think because we were a home full of books, yeah. my parents used to read. I think that is a very important thing when kids see their parents reading and enjoying books. And of course they used to share books with us in the sense that bedtime stories were, uh, it, it was a kind of ritual. And so we, uh, even though my parents used to be out at work most of the day and they used to take it in turns, but uh, at night someone would read to us and that, you know, that thing of books and people being connected, that has remained, you know. And we've also done that with our uh, children and now with the grandson, he's also very, uh, very fond of being read to, has to have the book there when you're telling the story. So that connection is not just with dry books, you know, it's people in books. Yeah, so that's uh, very interesting. So, so I, you know, I had heard, I had run into your mom many times, Mira Mascarinas, mm -hmm. the, in many history seminars in the 80s. Okay. Your dad I knew of as a name, Antonio mm. Mascarinas, mm. and he's you on remember. my bookshelves. I've, I, I don't think I've met right. him. I don't, didn't have the pleasure of mm. meeting him because he must have passed away early, you know, in that sense. No, no, he died yes. long after mom. Okay, okay, mm. okay. But, but yeah. maybe our paths didn't but cross. But he was less outgoing. So, know. so, but we'll come back to that. Yeah. Your book, Stray Mango Branches, I really thought it was unusual because it mixes fiction and non-fiction. Mm. It's very well written. The stories are very charming. Uh, people may or may not have noticed it because we are not so much a fiction reading state. But uh, I particularly like the story, Not Mum's Jaw. <laughs> And uh, within that story itself, although it's fiction, there's a quaint mix of fact and fiction. Yeah. You'd like to tell us about that? You know, I like to, uh, first of all, tease the reader. You know, m the readers who know the place, they should recognize, you know, the church, the cemetery and this and that. 
And uh, you can't uh, fictionalize all the people there. You can't fictionalize all the priests. Then it, it no longer rings true. Yeah. So at least one priest should have served there. The grave digger should should be the grave digger who's there. So you you have to have some characters who are real. For those who don't know, for those who don't know, not yeah. Mum's Jaw is this story set in the Vasco Cemetery. cemetery. Yes. And uh, you're searching for your you've gone there to dig up your mum's bones. Both. As is normal. Yes. After a few years. Well, uh, yeah. Both parents' both parents. Uh, bones. No, they had to and uh, then uh, you come across a bone, a jaw bone which doesn't look human at all. Mm. And uh, there is a priest who actually served there, our, go, both of our good friend, Father Nasim and yes. Mascarenas. Mm. And uh, when when you describe Father Nasim, and he poor, poor guy passed away recently, but he was a very good friend and a big yes. time you know fan of history, and he wrote many books, yeah. and we also worked on them and things like that. And he, when you describe him, he comes across as being very uh, like real. Of course, there are many twists and turns in this story. I yes. don't want to give it all away. I don't want to be a plot spoiler, but the readers can read for themselves. But what do you want to say about it? How did it come about? How did you get the idea? <laughs> How it came about is like many of the stories, you um, you want to send it to a magazine and okay, the first time I wrote it, it was 600 words for a particular slot. Then okay, uh, I rewrote, made it longer and I sent it to a, a Catholic university magazine in, in the Canada. Year, Canada. That editor was very interested in it but he found it too sunny. He says, is there a page missing? And then I wrote that nasty bit at the end. And then that, in the light of that, I, you know, I changed what came before to make it seem, you know, like a mother and daughter, uh, you know, tussle. Yeah. Otherwise, that had not been there in the, okay. in the original story. So with that came in the drama and conflict. And that, I think, improved the story. The other story which I really remember, I, I, I forget its name now, is this one where you have this hold up in the US. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a bit about that. That, that is a non fiction, no, I think. That is non fiction. What and happened? What happened? No, uh, you know how uh, it's so easy to break into their houses over there, and not that it isn't easy here, but there, they don't even have grills on the windows, and it's yeah. quite, uh, quite strange. People keep their windows wide open and go out. You know, it seems to you like a cinema set when you <laughs> first look at their houses. But this particular house where my brother used to live was at the end of the of the passage and you know it had a proper lock and all that and it was that house that was broken into. And when the ro uh, thieves, robbers, whatever are there, you all walk in? We walked in and it was midnight. We were returning from a concert and uh, they were inside. The door was open. <laughs> The most bizarre thing that happens to you. And I was, uh, you know, I was the last to uh, to come up. My brother was already there, and uh, he still had to take one of our friends home. So he was just opening the door to go away. Uh, the door was already open, and he was signalling to uh, to us who were behind. There's someone there. We thought he was fooling because all the way home we had been talking I about see. robberies and things like that. You know. Oh gosh. And, <laughs> and then, then we had to move away for the robbers to run. You've told we it didn't with, yeah. know whether, you know, they do carry guns quite often. We didn't know what he had in his hand was actually a gun. I was very surprised to get to know you in the first place because we also share a surname. Of course, we are not connected in that sense, no nepotism here. But the fact that you had been in writing for so many years, you have been in editing uh, based out of Vasco, uh, Chikali actually. Yes. And uh, we had never met, our paths had never crossed, though we have a lot of friends in common, maybe yes. a few years uh, separating us. Yes. Uh, tell us about, you know, I mean, uh, your freelancing, your husband's freelancing. It's interesting. I mean, Joe is a squadron leader. No, he became a, a group captain. Group captain. Okay, he, uh, in fact, he was cleared for the next rank, which was the one star. But in order to be with his other star, <laughs> he let go of that I see. and, you know, asked for premature retirement. But uh, he took up writing in a big way. 
after retirement because he has a lot of uh, expertise in flying. So he writes on aviation and now his, uh, you know, word count, uh, I think, may exceed mine. <laughs> so that's for the specialist uh, defense uh, yeah, press. Yes. Military on military issues, yeah. and the rest of y'all, the rest of the family. Oh, they are all into different things. Of course, we have a common thread of yeah. um, slightly religious writing, except for my brother, who is a pure scientist. I see. Also, very. Uh, and your dad was a was into history. He has authored this book uh, called Goa. Goa what? from prehistoric, prehistoric times. times. Goa from prehistoric times, which was. Very visible in the 70s and 80s, but now it's totally. You know, it came out in uh, in installments in Goa today. Yeah. And then it was published separately as a book. But you know, he wrote in a very free and easy way, I would say, yeah. because he had a lot of scholarship. But that's not the way he wrote the books, like you know, with uh, proper footnotes and all that. You know, he. Just let it flow. But every book need not be academic, written in an academic style. In those yeah. days, I found it quite interesting and quite yeah. useful and quite insightful. He had a lot of background, but he didn't write it in an academic yeah. way. And your mom was more into academic she history. She was a scholar and wrote like a scholar. <laughs> yeah. You know, checking every fact and putting it in the footnotes and all that. I'm sure I'd have some of her papers in my collection in the mm. local history seminars yeah. and things and things like that. But tell us about your other writing. I know uh, we have a lot of books here where you have contributed short stories. Chicken Soup for the Indian Bright yeah, Soul. Like this is again uh, non-fiction because it's a story but non-fiction. What's it about? Uh, that is... Um, Inspiration you know, for... Uh, something to do with uh, honeymoon. Okay. But <laughs> um, there are short stories in those um, books that Fundasang has brought up. Okay. Yeah, because that is a, a short story competition, competition that they have. So, so Fatima has a head start because, like, you got uh, BBC and all under your belt. So. Yeah, but uh, these are not uh, uh, competition winners, really. Yeah, yeah. It's that they. Uh, they know, were included in the selection of the know, top 25, people, the best yes, 25, the best 25. You know? And uh, tell us something about Daily Flash. Uh, Daily Flash, my uh, my sister Noemia is the one who started it. I see. Uh, she was she's always very fond of the bishops and this one and that one. And so uh, the the bishop emeritus, he's the one who encouraged her, and you know they initially funded. I see. Also. But there were uh, there were no hands uh, okay. to the plough, so initially she was writing several of the articles, and uh, someone in the neighbourhood was typing them out, and her near and dear friends were cycling to deliver them, and all that sort of thing. You know, it was kind of a, a small scale operation. <laughs> operation in Goa, everything is. If yeah. you don't do it yourself, it's not going to happen, no. Then later on, it became. You know, something part of the uh, of the bishop's uh, projects. So from then, it uh, like it's not that uh, it's not lay people who do it. It's the lay people who do it, but um, under the it the umbrella a, yeah. of um, of the, uh, the bishop, they have the. So you have contributed quite a bit. Quite a bit. In fact, my husband now contributes more because he is the editor. I see. This diocesan center for lay apostolate is uh, in charge of getting it printed and getting it distributed and all that. So that part of the thing is, is seen too. But uh, collecting the articles and editing, you know, not a small matter. It takes a long takes time. A long time. And sometimes a lot of persuasion because you have to get things in time. We work about three and a half months ahead of the date, so people don't yes. quite appreciate how much goes in, how much of work goes into this. And since yeah. you yourself have been into editing, yeah. uh, you'll run a small editing operation out of. Yeah, home. so that is a different thing. Okay. Because there you don't have to be very bothered about people's egos. When it is uh, an operation like this, you have to be very careful, voluntary, very, voluntary. very tactful. 
you know. So that, I'm glad my husband's doing, not I. I was not blessed with a lot of tact. But I do the uh, editing as a professional thing. And that, they know. They, uh, uh, they paid you <laughs> in order to get their book into shape. What about so, your other writing? Uh, I mean, the other other forms of your writing, can you tell us a bit about? No, for Daily Flash also, yeah. I have uh, written series of articles, like one was on uh, on the documents of Vatican II, because we celebrated 50 years of Vatican II, so bringing okay. those back again. So each of the documents that, uh, you know, are of, of real interest to lay people now, and You've uh, done your PhD in philosophy on in a subject, philosophy, uh, the subject which goes clean over my head and I couldn't understand anything of it. The concept of person, but for a, a theologian, the concept of person is something very much alive. You know, it's, <laughs> it's what we, we say three persons, one God and all that. That concept of person is related to that. This was when and which university? This was, uh, well, I was already doing it at the time when I got married and then I completed my PhD uh, when I was about to give birth, so. Uh, which university? It was University of Bombay. Bombay. It was through Goa. I see. But we had a center. CPI at yeah, Center yeah, for, so center for Postgraduate From here we were. You know, working under them. Working under Bombay. And right. my professor from here became head of uh, operations in uh, Bombay University uh, Philosophy Department. I'm Writing a short story is a very challenging and disciplined kind of job. No? You yeah. have a limited word count and you have yes. to make your point fast. Yes. Yeah. And if you're writing for Daily Flash, you have only 250 words. I see. Yes. Yeah, so f per reflection, 250 words, not for the articles. Yeah. The articles are longer, but for the reflections, you have to stick to the point, you know. So if you have, if you've written for Daily Flash, you can write short stories. You can write flash fiction. <laughs> <laughs> That's true of also, you know, uh, chicken soup. That's true of your BBC short stories. The word count is very important. Yes. So you have to be very disciplined in that yeah. sense. And, uh, but there, you know, the word count is about two thousand words. Yeah. More it's space. more the time that it takes to read. It's not exact according to okay. the words, you know. Okay. So editing also is according to the time it takes to read. Thirteen minutes and that's it. Haven't you been tempted by writing a novel at some stage or non-fiction, more serious stuff? I am not that long-winded. <laughs> a novel, uh, first of all, it's a big work. You have to stick at it. I, uh, I've never had that kind of time. And I don't think I have that kind of determination. Maybe a collection of short stories, related short stories, maybe that sometime. Does Goa do justice to the short story? Do we have enough of it happening? Or Like now Fundasau is having the competitions yeah. and they are publishing volumes. Yeah. Yeah. But for a long time we have not had anything. Earlier, mm -hmm. earlier the Portuguese papers carried, carried. carried short stories. Yeah. And uh, earlier also uh, some of the papers did carry, mm. but they hardly paid. Mm. Now, the concept that a writer should be paid, uh, how does a writer live? Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Now, that concept exists elsewhere. elsewhere. Everywhere. But, of course, the market has gone up and down. There was a time when um, I could have, you know, on, lived on lived, it. Lived. But uh, now, things are... Yeah, a bit iffy. Very different. Uh, what's your advice to people who might want to enter the short story field? First of all, have a day job. <laughs> <laughs> but it takes uh, the pressure off you, no? Yes, because uh, although it adds pressure in another way, because the yeah, long it adds the pressure in another way. But also, uh, even if you do make money, it is not money that will come at a certain Regularly. point every month. Yeah. You know, so you. You have to eat every day. You have to see that you eat every day. So that is as far as living goes. But as far as writing goes, I think many uh, people plunge into it without the basics. And you must have the basics. Now you don't get the basics of grammar in school. Yeah. You have to get. Uh, if you've not got it in school, you must get it somehow. Yeah. You don't plunge into a language without knowing the language. 
you can write a story, it can be very interesting, but if the language is bad... Yeah, it will not go beyond that point yes, and people just, are going to yeah, shoot it down. It's not going to go further, yeah. you know. I think uh, many who start writing, maybe start writing for the papers, but it's just hilarious the kind of language that we see in our papers. True. You know, so... Those Standards who, are something we are compromising yes, so at all sometimes times. Sometimes uh, the kids who come to me say, how do we start writing? I say, you first start editing the articles that you read in the papers. You know, just yeah. edit. Get used to... Be the, conscious of the mistakes. Be conscious of what you have to be, uh, yeah. you know, writing. Then conscious of word length and this and that. Of the beginning, beginning with a punch and ending properly with the tail and maybe a twist in the tail. All that uh, sort of thing. That there should be matter, but you place it in different ways. And you must know what you're writing about. So You need to read a lot also. You, no? you need, need to, to read, read a others. lot. You need to read a lot for the style. You need to read a lot for the... Uh, form. For the form. And then when you write, you have to keep checking. It may be fiction, but you have to have the details correct. You know, you have to check on everything. So, uh, fiction becomes more difficult to write than an article because sometimes, or even non-fiction, because non-fiction, you know it happened this way. You can check, but you already know that it yeah. happened this way. You know the place, okay, you may check for, yeah, for you fact. Know, exact facts yeah. and this and that, dates and things like that, but it did happen that yeah. way. Whereas in fiction, you're not only making it up, but you have to make sure it Works. gels with what you're Real. talking about. The, that, you know, somebody who, uh, suppose you're writing about a scientist, it, you'll have to study that bit of science to, to know what they do and how they You operate. have to work itself out in your head yes. and it should be plausible. It has to be plausible. Sometimes I mean, you're reality. you're not a politician. Politicians say what they like and it needn't be plausible. It is post-truth. <laughs> I mean, we've seen it in yeah. this election. It's just post-truth. Non-fiction and fiction are not post-truth. Fiction has a truth of its own. Sometimes fiction, uh, fact is stranger than fiction. Like if we are yes. to if we are if you are to tell us a story of your brother's the heist in his house, yeah, we, it would have been seemed impossible, what implausible. What about uh, uh, Mum's jaw? That horse was actually buried in our cemetery. Really. I, I thought mean, you were joking. It was no. It he was. Okay. It was buried Outside. in a place which became part of our cemetery after the expansion. Okay, there was a fence here, and then the fence was there, so it concluded the horse. Now my readers did not believe that was possible, and so fact is stranger than when, fiction. When you say these things, many uh, viewers in Vasco are going to wonder what you're going to talk about. So yeah. they are probably going to search for your short story and try to read it. <laughs> but we won't spoil their joy. <laughs> the, the only thing is, I think it's available online. No, no? it's available you know, online. There was a professor of English who took me up on this and said that is not believable. You know, I see. that the horse was buried there. But that is the one that is the fact. The parts that seem that more fiction. like. That, yeah, uh, yeah, correct, know, the, correct. The parts seem more like uh, uh, but people believed, those were fiction. <laughs> so that's what makes a good writer, I guess, where fact and fiction right. merge and you yes. cannot... Uh, you know, because you hear people tell stories which they say have happened, you know, gossip yeah. style. There's so much fiction in it. I've learnt a lot from gossips, yeah. you know. Yeah. They are telling you something that is supposed to be true, but the, they've put in so much Masala. and they've suggested so much by their, what they believe happened, uh, that it is, is it fact or is it fiction, you know? So, actually when you write history, it's also that way. I There's guess no we, our subjectivity comes out and we a can... A lot of subjectivity. In any field, though in literature it's permissible, in history it's not yeah. supposed to be there, but it's but there. But it is there. Of course. And it's good that you realize that it is there. Yeah. Because uh, the history that comes to us from long ago is always told by the victors. What True. if you... True. Take it someone, you know, someone take else's it, yeah. side. I don't even have to ask this question, but I'm sure your daughters also must have got immersed into literature in a very big way. One, uh, one, is in, you know, one is into science, chemistry. Yes, but you know how it is. Now they practice writing on that, but uh, including yeah. fiction, like my elder one writes. You know, I see. Flash fiction, 
but it's all like that, I you see. know. Miniaturized, uh, miniaturized. They, uh, they get practice writing every day because they <laughs> they're communicating with so many yeah. people. But it is also a form of writing. True. You get the hang of how to get an idea across, even if you want to bluff someone. Yeah. You know. Though we look down on it, just like how our parents look down on, say, the yeah. Beatles in the seventies or sixties yeah. or yeah. whatever. So, I mean, it's just passing. A uh, lot of other short stories uh, in brave. New world of go and writing. Uh, this one I contributed uh, non-fiction. Non-fiction. It was a memoir of really long back, and now it's that is Lisbon, is, Christmas in. This was yes, about Christmas, Christmas in, in 1962. In Lisbon. Was 62 or 62? 62. 62. Yes. So <laughs> you 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 still remember that and? Uh, yes, you know I remember those years much better than I remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> yeah, Victor Angel Rivero was here last time and he uh -huh. was telling us that, you know, if you want to write fiction, that your tales of your childhood come across. In brief, tell us what you remember about Portugal in 62. About Portugal in 62, you know, the I can still get the smells, you I know. See. I, you know, when we walked to school, there was a fellow who used to sell chestnuts. Now, in winter, you first of all want the Heat. you know the sweet smell of sweet chestnuts smell. you know i cannot describe to you how appealing it is to you know pass the chestnut seller so those sort of things they are so clear in the mind you know the school itself the friends in lisbon which locality uh, it was uh, one of the newer localities in relation to old Lisbon yeah. and uh, if you went further and further you would reach the airport. I see. So from our terrace we could see, I see. Uh, you know, the tail lights flashing. I see. It was not that close but we could see it because it was the sixth floor. But I think now with many skyscrapers around yeah. you would not see any of that even though the distance is the same. And uh, if you then you came back to Goa in the late 60s? It or? was not coming back, it was yeah. for the first time. Okay. You know? okay. We, uh, my mother brought us in 1964 to Goa, that was the first time. She saw whether we would survive, <laughs> took us back yeah. to Lisbon. My brother didn't go back, he was in uh, Mount Tabo in, okay. uh, in a boarding school. Uh, we, two sisters, were taken back and uh, we wound up. A couple I of see. years we were there and uh, came to settle. So in 68, my parents settled in. And Europe. then studying in uh, Vasco? In Vasco, St. Teresa's. St. Teresa's and of course, uh, Camels, which was very Kamel. new. Yes. And I mean, that's another story in itself. We won't even go there because I mean, that story is waiting to be told. No? Yes. So I, we meet so many people on the net who grew up in that period and it's yes. a big story. <laughs> but I really hope that you know I see much more writing from your pen because uh, whatever little I read especially in stray mango branches was so charming and so interesting <laughs> and I'm so glad that uh, doctor you managed to come here and I managed to convince you to come otherwise you're so modest about your writing your work and all that and no, one, uh, one does what one is supposed to do you know yeah but still yeah. you should if, if no one talks about it then it gets less of a prominence than it should get but nowadays there are so many people writing um, but everyone we, contributes to the strand. We, we will, maybe we will see what lasts, but maybe we will not because, uh, you know, there is a kind of noise level when so many people on, are uh, writing. On that philosophical note, I really thank you for making it today <laughs> on behalf of CCR TV and thanks so much for sharing thank your you. views and your work with our audiences. Thanks. Thank you, Frederick, and thanks for getting me here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.